uh, war is actually from Long Beach. I know they claim a lot of South LA and Compton and stuff, and but two of them are from Long Beach and they actually formed in Long Beach as well. Uh, the, rem the remnants of that band still play at like the MLK parades and stuff in Long Beach um, every day or every year. So that not every day, that'd be weird. Um, the pyramids penetration. This is a photo of the pyramids here. And um, as you can see, some of them are black, which was kind of weird for, for surf rock bands to have an, an integrated surf rock band like that. They also, they, they're all have, they all have shaved heads, and they used to come out with these uh, like fake Beatles wigs on where they had like mop tops, and then they'd rip them off and then go into playing their songs. So they kind of like to flip all that on their heads. Um, and they were, they were a Long Beach band as well. They had a song called Do the Slosset, which is about, uh, it's a dance up on, you know, based on Slosset Avenue here. Um, then the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band is a country folk rock band formed in Long Beach as well. And we, we love Janet Green. <laughs> as uh, Dennis told me, he found her records at a thrift store when he was in high school, and he uh, continues to cover them and play them and stuff. She was uh, the anti-communist answer to the left-wing folk singers. So, uh, and her record label, Chan 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 Chantico? Mm -hmm. Is that how you pronounce it? Sure. I've only seen it written. So. Um, they were America's premier anti-communist record label, and they were based in Long Beach. So of all things, uh, right. This is probably more of the Iowa by the Sea yeah. coming out. But as you can see, she's saying fascist threat and commie lies. Yeah. And that was her hit record. There's all kinds of diversity in Long Beach. And the, the fact <laughs> yeah. that this right-wing record label was there for so long is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can see that even before that there was, there was a large range of music coming out of Long Beach. Um, it also had an interesting role in hardcore punk, which is always seen as kind of the suburban uh, white man's uh, music. But, um, and there wasn't a lot. It wasn't as big as South Bay, obviously, and not as big as Huntington Beach in Orange County and stuff, but SST Records did end up in Long Beach. That's a photo of the studio, of the sign, which is actually where Fingerprints Records is now. If you ever go down to Long Beach, um, finger, that's the parking lot for Fingerprints, uh, the music store now. But um, SST was in Long Beach for a long time, not in the heydays of SST, but a little bit later in the 80s is, I believe, when he moved. I can't find an exact date on it. Uh, but TSOL, two of the four members are from Long Beach. Uh, Jack Grisham grew up kind of in the suburban part of town. And Rhino 39 was the other big Long Beach band. They went to Millican High School, which is also kind of in the suburban areas. So not so much the inner city, the dense and urban parts of town contributed to hardcore, but, um, but more of the suburban areas did birth some things. But they always had to kind of align themselves with one side or the other. So TSOL kind of got lumped in with the Orange County hardcore. Uh, but they did have venues. Uh, the Fender's Ballroom is a big venue. You can, it was the, one of the only places in that part of town that could hold 1,500, 2,000 people. And there was also the Samoan, what's it called? Angry Samoans? Isn't that the, the, the Samoans that used to patrol the Fender's Sons Ballroom? Sons of, Sons of Samoa. Samoa. There we go. They were a Samoan gang. And so we had security in the city built in. So people would book the shows in Long Beach because you had security that was already there, whereas LA wouldn't allow that anymore. The police couldn't keep, keep it under control. So a lot of shows ended up at Fender's Ballroom in Long Beach, which inevitably uh, had a lot of fighting happen because that's the place where the South Bay and the Orange County kids came together and they didn't much like each other. So uh, it ended up becoming sort of a liminal space where things uh, festered. So through the, I'm skipping over the 80s, I'll go back to it because that's kind of what our discussion is about. But in the late 90s and, and 2000s, you have a lot of different things come up. Um, this is uh, Mars Volta on the bottom there, and that's IP in the, in the middle, and he's a Long Beach guy. And so he, uh, he started de facto in Long Beach with uh, Cedric Fixler Zavala and Omar Rodriguez Lopez. Uh, and when they had moved from San Antonio, they moved to Long Beach and just started gigging with all these local people. And they had a little warehouse space, and they started de facto, which was a Long Beach band. Uh, and before they left Long Beach, they started Mars Volta, which is now kind of a vent and arena rock uh, band. And um, Ike now plays with Free Moral Agents, which is uh, the band that he is in. And um, Jenny Rivera is, oh, I play in here. I had a Jenny Rivera album or a song for her. Sorry. So definitely in the late 90s and 2000s, you have a big, uh, oh, whoops. There we go. You have a lot of uh, different genres coming out. And Jenny Rivera, who recently passed away, but also her brother Lupio and, um, and her father Pedro, who started a record label. They were one of the first record labels to put out tapes of corridos, the, uh, the, the music of like the Mexican-American farm workers and stuff in the 80s. And that was the record label is still to this day based on Market Street in Long Beach. Um, and so I like this song from Jenny Rivera. She talks about her ovarios, but she talks about them like obviously ovaries, but she talks about them like cojones. Like she uses the word in the same way that, that like guys would use like their balls, like their strength. So like her ovaries are her strength. Let's just play a few seconds of that. <laughs> Quieren 
so she goes into a part later, a little bit later in the song. She goes into a part where she says, "Los ovarios que me carga son ovarios de Playa Larga," which means like the ovaries that I carry are ovaries from Long Beach. So like the city of Long Beach gave her these these balls and gave her these guts to, to go do this because she was one of the first women. I mean, this is an album from the early '90s. So she looks a lot different than the, fo than the photos of her later years, um, where she was kind of more of a cross. She was going to be a crossover act. So she had a, a, a deal signed with NBC4 to do a, a, an English language uh, sitcom about her. But she, at the time, she was the only woman that was singing corridos. She was in a man's world, and it was because her dad and her uh, brother had been so involved in it and invested in it. So she came. She kind of came out like in a. I mean, she makes Selena look like a daddy's girl. Personally, I, I think that yeah, Selena was. <laughs> Selena was nothing compared to what Jenny had to go through, and she uh, she went to Poly. Actually, it was at school at the same time that Snoop Dogg was at Poly High School. So if you could kind of see like that, these two crazy people went to the same school at the same time and went off to have different different but nonetheless meaningful careers. Um, and then Pratch Lee, who is a Cambodian rapper, let me go back to this. And he was born he was born in the, in a well he likes to call it a concentration camp but it was like a, um, a just a refugee camp on the Thai border uh, during the killing fields and there's a huge huge Cambodian community in Long Beach it's one of the largest in the world outside of Cambodia uh, there's a whole stretch called Cambodia Town of Anaheim Street all the writings in Khmer and everything and so he is a, he's a Cambodian born or Southeast Asian born moved here when he was very young and has sort of become a spokesperson for the Cambodian community and for like the the killing fields and all the stuff that happened uh, back there. So he records these albums in Long Beach and then sends them either via email or mail. C he will mail CDs back to Cambodia and they end up on underground radio. He's the one, he's the number one selling rapper and artist in Cambodia, but he lives in Long Beach. So this is actually this song is in Khmer, so you won't be able to understand it. So a lot of his stuff is is actually in English because he wants to be that he wants to be approachable and he wants the message to get out to other people. The Cambodian community in Long Beach is really good about reaching out to the other ethnic communities in Long Beach and the white community as well. I guess white's ethnic community too. But um, yeah, they're very, he's, he does rap in English about what happened in Cambodia. So his stuff is really significant. He doesn't perform as much. He does. He speaks at a lot of college campuses. They bring him in when they talk about genocide and, and art and culture and how it relates to all of that. Um, but he's a really significant figure in Long Beach, and not a lot of people realize that he is in our hometown most of the time. So that's kind of what was going on then. And then we also have modern day stuff. Uh, free moral agents, as I mentioned, um, are they uh, they combine a lot of different things. Ike Owens has been playing since this time period that we're talking about, the late 80s, same with Dennis. So they have almost two decades of, of Long Beach experience kind of culminating in this one band. Um, uh, Mendy is half Japanese, she's the singer, and there's, uh, is Ryan Hispanic, the drummer? He's half Latino. He, he's half Latino, and then there's two black guys. So, I mean, it's really, like, just the, the look of the people on the stage, I hate to, like, parse it down to what people look like, but just the, like, just the members of the bands look very diverse. And the music is all over the board. One of the first albums had a rapper on it, and they, you guys have played at um, uh, Low End Theory, the, more the, um, the electronic club, electronica club. They fit right in all over the board. It could be rock, it could be jazz, it could be, you know, electronic music, uh, it could be hip-hop, could be everything all over the board. So I'm going to play a song from them as well. I'm 
I could listen to Femoral Agents all the time. I was listening to them on the way up here, actually. Um, but then, it, and then it expands. The song kind of builds and builds and builds into these beautiful crescendos, and and then they then they just de-evolve into some like free jazz thing sometimes. And it, just watching them live is beautiful. I love it. Um, and they play very often. You guys, how often do you guys play in Long Beach? You guys are playing a couple times a month now. It seems like it. It feels like it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, very, yeah, they're probably one of the more out there um, bands, like playing frequently and just did a European tour last year, a national tour, that kind of stuff. Um, Avi Buffalo is also another one, local Long Beach band. They signed to Sub Pop Records, Nirvana's old label. They were one of the first Long Beach bands to like hit the blogosphere, like of the first of the like the millennial generation, let's say, to, to get their name out there. Uh, of course, nobody really mentions that they're from Long Beach when they, because they... <laughs> <laughs> they're just really young. They're, they are. They were in high school. Band. They were in high school when they first started. It's I mean, they're probably 19 here, because right. Rebecca's still in the band, so this was like before they were 21, for sure. And they played All Tomorrow's Party. Stephen Malcolm has personally invited them to All Tomorrow's Parties before their album had even come out. Um, but Avi, and Avi Zahner, is the, he's this guy right here, and he plays a lot of really interesting uh, stuff. He grew up with blues musicians and jazz musicians and plays in a Baptist church band and stuff too. So just a lot of freaky influences coming together, even with the younger generation who have access to the internet and stuff. Um, and then Dengue Fever um, down here, I love that instrument. It's called a Mastodong. It's a totally custom instrument. And it's a, it's a combination of a Fender Jazz Master and a tra traditional Cambodian guitar called a Chapai Dong Vang. And that there, ergo the Mastodong. Um, <laughs> kind of an unfortunate name, I think, for an instrument. But, um, and so they came down. All the, the guys in the back are actually from L.A. They're not from Long Beach. But they came to Long Beach to find a Cambodian singer. They really looked, fell in love with like the Cambodian psych rock and all this music that was kind of cut off by the Khmer Rouge. So they came to Long Beach and they found her. Her name is Trom Namol, the singer. And they found her at a place called Dragon House, which is two blocks from my place. It's like this Cambodian nightclub that on Friday night goes off. And she had just moved out here from Cambodia. She was a pop, Cambodian pop star. And they found her, and she's joined this like Cambodian psych rock, you know, revival band kind of that plays fairly often. Oh, whoops. <coughs> just meant to go to the next one. So we are fo here we're focusing on the late 80s, early 90s. That was like an overview of everything that's been going on in the past and the future and present. Um, but we're really focusing on the late 80s, early 90s, when all of this hybridity sort of came to a head. Um, and uh, so that, this was kind of when the port expanded the borders, the international city became the, the name, the, the nickname for the city. Um, and you have not just one sound, like maybe you know, uh, Seattle would have the grunge sound, the Seattle sound, or even what we have in LA, the smell sound. Uh, there wasn't such thing as a Long Beach sound. That just didn't exist. Everyone was playing different things, but they were all playing together. Uh, and I love this quote from a former city council member. This was said in 1989. He said, we're going to be different from anywhere else, and we're going to do things differently because a Cambodian, a Hispanic, and a Jew share the same space. We will see new kinds of institutions made by new kinds of people. And uh, I just love the prophecy of that, how <laughs> it kind of came true. So a lot of people know about Sublime, obviously, and everyone knows Sublime's from Long Beach, but what, what the hell does it mean that Sublime is from Long Beach? Where, what, why, why do we say they're from Long Beach? Why do they rep Long Beach so hard? Uh, and I always like to think of things in equations. It seems to be easier that way. Uh, <laughs> everything's just a math equation. So, I mean, it's pretty it's simplified totally, but uh, I, I think it works for, for what Sublime was. It was all of these things in one. Um, and then I found this photo of them in Mexico, which apparently Marshall remembers being at. Um, I just found it on Tumblr. So I'm going to play this one. This is a Sublime song. It's kind of a deep B-side. Everyone knows all their songs that were on the radio, Dave Rape and What I Got and all that stuff. And But this was, I love this one because it starts off with, starts off with a rock beat, like this 4-4 signature, and then it just flips it over and turns it into a reggae song. And the roots of creation is what, they, is what people in Jamaica call reggae music. So it's interesting to hear you know, a white guy in, from Long Beach relating so much to, the, to this culture that's half a world away almost.
lyrics of that too. He says we're living in a boring nation and so the music for him was the way to get away from that. It wasn't politicized like it was in, in Kingston where it was this, this rebel music and political and everything. He just thought it sounded good and made him, there's a line in there where he says, it makes me feel at ease. So it's like, it just makes <coughs> me feel good. You can smoke a joint and enjoy it. So I like that that became it, uh, sort of the sig one of the signature sounds, the reggae and the dub and everything. You can find a lot of that even in, even in little bits in most Long Beach music uh, from this time. Um, except in the hip hop area, where you have uh, the two and three, and obviously Snoop Dogg, Nate Dogg, and all, and all those guys, Warren G. Uh, and they, came, they all came out of VIP Records, which had a recording studio in the back where these guys could cut demo tapes and stuff. So VIP Records was really inf instrumental in this scene coming up and coming off of the ground. Um, the VIP Records originally was like a gospel store. They had a lot of, uh, of the music from the 60s, the doo-wop and gospel records and stuff. So, uh, And I've read interviews with Nate Dogg, who unfortunately is not with us anymore, where he talks a lot about um, how his grandma's, uh, he listened to his grandmother's music, his grandmother's uh, gospel music and stuff. And that was really influential to him. So when you hear the difference, and I like to use this verses because Coming out around the same time was NWA, obviously. So how is what the music? What, how is hip hop in Long Beach different from hip hop in South Central or in in Compton, where a lot of these other uh, gangster rappers were coming out around the same time? But all you gotta do is listen to "Regulate" by Warren G and the Two and Three Crew and Boys in the Hood, which are which are ex saying essentially the same thing. They're talking about how hard they are, how many asses they kicked, how many drugs they did, and how people are afraid of them. And but they say them in totally different ways. Um, you know, NWA is aggressive, and it's it's kind of ta it's talking to you and talking at you. And uh, regulate kind of brings you along, like oh, let's go for a ride. We're gonna go. Uh, what do they say? Uh, Nate Dog make the bodies go cold. But that, I mean, they say it in such a nice way you don't even realize he just said that he killed someone. Um, <laughs> you're like, oh yeah, they they did come up on some guys that were gambling in the street and they shot that guy. Uh, but in NWA, it's a lot easier to be able to tell that, uh, especially in Boys in the Hood. And I won't. I'm sure you guys are familiar with both those songs, so I won't play them. But just to understand how the Long Beach sound was so different from the other gangster rap that was coming out, especially the hip hop that was coming from the East Coast even before that, and why the West Coast sound is the Long Beach sound. The West Coast sound that we hear now is basically what came out on Dr. Dre's The Chronic, which was uh, which was Compton and Long Beach, now you're in trouble. So that's the entire, <laughs> that's like the West Coast sound now is what came on that album, which is when Dr. Dre connected with the Long Beach guys and they influenced him and they gave him that more laid back vibe. Uh, and it, it, the best way I can describe it is like the, the NWA was like barking at you, it was like yelling at you and telling you, it was very aggressive instead of being more incorporating. And so I think this was the, that was the turning point when it became more pop music and you could put Snoop Dogg on the radio and everyone could kind of flow along with it and it became a lot more accessible uh, rather than the gangster rap that before that was a little more inaccessible, purposely so. Uh, and then you have Suburban Rhythm, which is in the house right now. Um, and uh, they were short-lived on uh, four years, you guys were together? Three years. Three, three, four years. Um, but, I, but in that short amount of time, they built up a really crazy following. And there were other bands, uh, and it was at the same time as Sublime, at the same time as No Doubt was starting as well, all these other bands. And they also combined this two-tone ska, punk, funk, everything together, kind of fishbone-y. But while fishbone was definitely more aggressive and more punk influence, uh, Suburban Rhythm had a definite more funk influence, uh, funkier, funkier over, undertones. Uh, and so in just in a short amount of time, they really did influence a lot of OC ska bands. And that whole second, that third wave ska revival that we talk about today with Real Big Fish and Save Ferris and all these other bands, really kind of germinated with what the guys in Long Beach were doing and, um, and, and what No Doubt was already doing. But they, everybody was feeding off of each other. And when Suburban Rhythm, they never released a, an actual album officially. We had some mixtapes and a, a vinyl, I believe. Um, but when they when they actually did release like a posthumous record a compilation in 97 they broke up in 94 97 was this album that was released the members of no doubt wrote the liner notes to it if that says anything about significance uh, to no doubt and real big fish to this day has a song called SR and it's the title of my thesis so the whole the chorus is whatever happened to suburban rhythm why did Ed and Scott quit? And what does he say? All the other bands, please don't go suburban rhythm. All the other bands are just shit, is the lyrics. And they play it continually. They still to this day play it at all the shows. And the thing I find the most interesting is that it's the song that they play in different genre forms. So there's a punk version of SR, there's a reggae version of SR, there's a country version of SR. They play it in all these different genres, which I just think is such a great homage to the band. And so it, it makes, makes so much sense that, that, that they play it in all these different genres too. So. 
actually, when I was doing my research on suburban rhythm, the, the people that were keeping the idea of suburban rhythm alive were all real big fish fans. The Wikipedia page was all populated by real big fish fans. So it's kind of, it's in the set, like with uh, Sublime, where Bradley Knoll kept his favorite reggae artists alive through Sublime and brought them to a wider audience. Real Big Fish did the same thing, bringing the suburban rhythm to a wider audience that might not have had the chance to listen to it before. Uh, so now we're talking about institutions, like that was kind of how the music was created, but how does it sustain? It sustains through an economy, which didn't really exist in Long Beach, separate, I mean, uh, culture economy, separated from uh, the, the Sunset Strip and all those pay to play shows and things like that that didn't really exist. There wasn't a Roxy or anything in Long Beach. There, wasn't, there weren't really <laughs> legitimate venues, so to speak. Um, so you have Fender's Ballroom, which I mentioned before, uh, Bogarts, where national acts came through and would play with local, local acts as well. And then the Toe Jam, which seems to be everyone's favorite. What was it called before? Grand Central Station. Grand Central Station. So Toe Jam is now the Roscoe's and Chicken and Waffles on Broadway, which also houses the Seabird Jazz Lounge. So I love the fact that there's just always been music in this space and such different music the whole time. Um, this is one of my favorite flyers I've found, just because it shows you have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, live bands, K-Rock, hip, rap, funk. So like <laughs> three totally different nights, on the, you know, right in the same space. Um, the venue had two separate rooms that were separated by a bar in the middle, so it was not uncommon for there to be like an industrial night on one side and a hip hop night on the other side, and then everyone has to go to the bar to get their drinks. So you have like MCs talking to you know industrial goth kids with black eyeliner and stuff, just kind of at the same bar, and that wasn't that wasn't uncomfortable. Everyone just kind of checks each other's stuff out, and so you can't help with this overlap when you have venues such as this. Um, the Long Beach Arena hosted a lot of live albums just over time. I think Deep Purple recorded three there. Um, Iron Maiden, are you ready to rock Long Beach? Or let me hear you scream, Long Beach. Scream for Long Beach. Sorry, excuse me. Come on. Someone seemed to make shirts with it on there, so I'll remember. Uh, it's actually really hard to find that, that, that audio online. Yeah, I was trying to find it for there, because there's all these other live things, but not that one. Um, but it is, for Iron Maiden fans, very, very uh, remember, memorable moment. Um, but that was also in Long Beach. And then obviously the house parties, because without these large traditional venues, house parties were the place to be. Sublime was a house party band. They were the house party band. You, you say Sublime, people would say Sublime is going to play just to get people to show up at the house party. And then they may or may not have played. <laughs> so they were, uh, the house parties were definitely a big, big important part of that. Um, and then last but not least, the independent record stars were very, very important during this period. Um, because there were so many of them, and each one had a genre that they catered to. There wasn't like an Amoeba Records where you could go and have everything. And now kind of Fingerprints has picked up a lot of that, where the, you can go into Fingerprints and get world music and get all this other stuff. Um, but at the time, Fingerprints was like the college radio, the rock store, kind of. Um, but you had VIP, as I mentioned before. Culture Beat was the reggae store, and that's where the Sublime members went, right? Um, I know that Bradley used to go in there all the time. I've heard stories about that, of him going in and just buying this, this, the, the 45s and the new singles. And you can hear them directly in, into, put into some Sublime songs. The Caress Me Down is a direct cover of an early 90s reggae song called Caress Me with an M-I, um, which I like to think in my ideal world that he picked it up at Culture Beat and then went and made that song. But this is uh, Courtney on the right, and he's the one that ran This is in Culture Beat, um, and that's his mom who came to visit from Jamaica. He's a, he's a Jamaican... Uh, I don't know if he's an expat or if he's a if he's a citizen here or what. Do you know? I don't. Yeah, I just I know he is Jamaican and his family's in Jamaica, so he has that kind of connection. And after he closed the store, he went back and, and he lived in Kingston and was giving tours and stuff to tourists. Uh, Zed Records, the flyer for which is up here, was a punk store, and they started doing imports from England in the late '70s when no one else had them. The owner's brother used to write for NME and would send him things. So they were like one of the only places in the greater LA area that had Misfits records and uh, Echo and the Bunny Men and all these things that there was no such thing as an import market. And then as the import market grew, then they became more of a punk store. Um, and eventually at the end, uh, Dennis actually worked there when it, when it uh, evaporated. And he says that at the end, it was all Sublime Bootlegs, which I love the full circle. <laughs> the punk store ended up making its money selling Sublime Bootlegs back at the end of it all. Um, 1010 Records was another little store. A lot of in-stores happened there. There, and the tape and record room and bagatelles were good spots to go and, uh, and fish for records as well. So that's kind of the primer, the overview uh, that will, I think, help inform the conversation that, uh, that um, Brett's going to moderate for us right now. Great. Thank you. Thanks.
Yeah, so I was going to get a little background. I'm going to try to hold this thing because we're past time a little bit. Because what I want to do in this next section is really kind of just ask some questions, uh, particularly guys from the scene, in the scene, in these bands, uh, and figure out how they work. And so uh, kind of talk a little bit about that for a little bit, starting kind of in general, then moving into some more specific things about these uh, clubs, infrastructural kind of questions, and some thoughts in general about scenes. And we'll open up to a larger discussion about Southern California localism stuff in general. And I guess my first question that we're thinking about, uh, you know, particularly for uh, Dennis and, and Marshall here, is like, you know, for each one of you, how did you kind of get started in music? Were you from Long Beach originally? Did you wind up there later? If you came to Long Beach from somewhere else, what was the lure of Long Beach? And when you got there, then how did your bands get together? How did you find people? Was it tied to uh, high schools or jobs or local scenes? I mean, today all my students get their bandmates from Craigslist. <laughs> but, you know, it's a different world back in the pre-internet kind of era. And so I don't know if you want to mm -hmm. maybe start with one of those. Dennis, and then we'll get Marshall. Um, well, I always had a lifelong interest in music, and all throughout high school, I was pretty obsessed with being in a band, and never could get it together until right after graduation, and uh, started the band Suburban Rhythm with a few high school friends, and uh, eventually we found our bass player through word of mouth, and we found our first drummer through the recycler. <laughs> Everybody remembers the recycler. If you don't, that's okay. <laughs> Craigslist is much better. And... Um, but eventually, you know, we found our final drummer through word of mouth. And um, anyhow, to answer your other question, I am from Long Beach, Long Beach native. And um, what was the other part of the question? That's right, that's good. Okay, yeah, we'll yeah, we'll get Marshall done that one, and then we'll kind of. Um, I'm originally, I was born in Chicago, Cooks County Hospital, Southside Chicago. My father's from Southern Illinois, and he was a jazz guitarist, bluesman in essence. He, was born in 1929 and left the farm to go play music in Chicago. So I was raised with blues and uh, jazz. Essentially, one of his favorite guitarists was Chet Atkins, so there was some country in there as well. Um, moved to Long Beach, did all my schooling in Long Beach. Um, I had an older sister uh, that played saxophone, so she led me into the music scene. And where I met Brad um, and Eric is at our house when I was probably 15, and my sister was in a band with them called Sloppy Seconds. Mm -hmm. And it was the beginning of this ska rock kind of venture that turned into Sublime and in and, and the other projects. Um, but at that time, I wasn't even playing drums yet. I was a DJ. I, used to, I had turntables in my room and scratch. So Brad saw what I was doing and um, was very intrigued by the whole concept of, of two turntables and you know, uh, spin backs or making it repeat. And how are you doing that? Do you have echo on there? And, you know, I, so I showed him. But I also went to junior high school with Eric Wilson, who was the bassist of Sublime. And we were in the band together. He was in the drum section. His father was a, a great jazz drummer. So high school, backyard parties, as Sarah mentioned, um, I would go and grab the mic and freestyle because I was a break dancer, DJ, and into all of that scene. And I was more of a Uncle Jam's Army was one of my favorites on K-Day, which was a radio station. Um, I also listened to the Mighty 690 broadcast out of uh, Tijuana. And, but I was into the, I was drawn to hip hop, East Coast hip hop, Schooly D and Eric B and Rakim. So my whole thing was a different, it wasn't the gangster rap and stuff because I wasn't a gangster, I was actually scared of gangsters. So <laughs> I kind of stayed away from all of the Compton stuff and, and Long Beach wasn't as rough as Compton in, in LA and, and South Central and all that. So. I was drawn to the hip hop. And when I met Eric, he was a punk rocker. So as you were saying about Grand Central Station, there's a guy with eyeliner standing next to an MC. That was me, essentially, with Eric Wilson and my still best friend, Tony Reeves, who was an Alabama kid, all into Iron Maiden, the Eddie shirts and everything with fans. But we were best friends and still are to this day. But Eric and I met in the class. So at these backyard parties where I was rapping and freestyling with Sublime, you know, and, and Bud was the drummer at the time. Um, you know, just kind of introduced me to the band, and I got closer to Brad at the time. And Bud left, um, and they asked me, Eric said, Marshall plays drums, so I entered the band and became the drummer. So that's how I met the musicians and, and what have you in Long Beach. And everybody else from that point was a friend of a friend. I was in a band called World Trust for a while, worked at... Uh, Kagan Dependent was a singer. He worked at Zed Records, so I spent a lot of time at Zed Records as well um, as Culture Beat. But um, the other musicians I played in a band called Freezer from L.A. turned into Backlash. I met them through the same circle of musicians. I played in a band called Horace Dolores for a while. <laughs> same, Cliff Berrickman, who's on Finding Bigfoot right now. He, he, I was in a band with him. Um, 
Long Beach Stove All-Stars. Ike was in that band for a while. I mean, so it's all just, we never put ads out or anything. I was lucky in that way. I just had so many friends that were doing music. Just new people, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there because I can yeah. talk the whole time. Well, 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 it's really a question kind of comes out of it. Was where the influences were obviously meeting people in the different types of styles and places. But what was the role of, say, for example, radio or or, or of these record stores? One of the things that's always intrigued me is how, and I think we have partly the answers here. How does the kind of reggae ska sound wind up moving into Long Beach and getting then absorbed by so many different people in the city? I don't know if either one you want to talk about that, given how important the reggae dub stuff was to Sublime, and of course the suburban rhythm story like I mean, where does that kind of sound come from in addition to kind of records or how do people get into it um, well I got into it a friend of mine introduced me to a band called the specials mm -hmm. and I was speaking to Marshall the other evening about that and I think that was your introduction to absolutely Jamaica, to kind of the whole Jamaican absolutely. music world and um, it, I think it makes sense that that kind of music resonates in Long Beach I mean first of all we have you know similar weather um, <laughs> we have nice weather in Long Beach and you know a lot of a lot of Jamaican and a lot of the origins of Jamaican music are based around an area, a coastal areas, and um, you know also in Long Beach there's kind of a laid back vibe. You know, as about a million rap songs from Long Beach have stated, <laughs> and um, I just I just think that I just think it makes sense for that for that influence to to kind of permeate throughout Long Beach, and. Um, so, you know, we got into it through kind of that two-tone ska movement, and then, you know, obviously since the specials cover a lot of old Jamaican tunes, you want to hear where the originals come from, so you get into the original versions of some of the songs that they do, and then from there, it's just kind of like you go down the different roads and you figure out where they got their sound from, and then you discover this whole world of amazing music of ska, rock steady, reggae, dub, dance hall, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, it's, it's a, you know, the specials were kind of a doorway for a lot of us, and, um, yeah. Definitely, and I think it's part to do with the fact that Elvis Costello produced their first record, and, and you know, he's a mm -hmm. pop artist, so mm -hmm. that kind of, I guess he used his exposure to bring them into the pop realm. They weren't, weren't really a pop band. Yeah. They are kind of more... Rudy, like you know, rough, kind of more punk. punk. Rock. Yeah. And, were, and just because I'm interested in the, the motions, there were people trading tapes of this. Would you buy? Would you go to Culture Beat and say, could you buy a specials record? Were there people with record collections you'd be taping stuff or listening to? Because I mean, I remember trying to listen to Jamaican music. I was a D Jamaican DJ on our college radio station in the 1980s. And it was hard to find a lot of stuff. I mean, you had to really kind of you know, it's again this difference with technology today is mm -hmm. we can Google and find any obscure song almost instantaneously. But you know, was there a sense of people like, here, I've got this tape of this. Well, Someone gave me an old early Marley record someone gave me well funny enough the specials I got at Music Plus because you know that, were, a chain? that was a chain so store somewhere like, like Sam Goody or whatever but as far, if you want to find more obscure music you'd go to places like Culture Beat you know they would carry a lot of they'd carry a lot of 45s or reggae 45s reissues reissues of Rocksteady and Ska 45s I mean you could even go to, to Zed Records which is mostly a punk rock record store but they would even have reissues of things on the Trojan Records label which is a reggae reissue label out of England and um, you know that, yeah I mean those are probably the two main places you could go I mean later on in the early 90s there was another place called Ten Ton Records they were kind of a you know an indie rock you know record store they were kind of the first store in the area to carry like all the bands that became known as Britpop bands but they would also carry, you know, they they would they would also carry a lot of that kind of music as well, a lot of the you know Jamaican style music. And I mean, there you know there was, you know, we we had a, we had our sort, you know, we had places to go in Long Beach. It wasn't quite as extensive as like you know going to L.A. and finding all these different record stores. But you know, we had our places where we could go. And you know, Bob Marley Day was an important activity uh, as well. Yep, and Bob Marley Day. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the the Warner once or twice that the Fresh Fest was in Long Beach. I think it was only once because there was a humongous fight and then the, um, <laughs> was at the convention center. We yeah. told them that you can't come back here, no way. But um, Bob Marley Day was an important thing for us, our circle. We used to go there every year and you'd get exposed to the modern um, reggae artists. And then of course, as Dennis said, um, the record stores, Culture Beat was the main source because they again had imports. So we, um, Brad and I and the people we were with were into what's not out. You know, we didn't want, we heard the legend, we heard, we wanted to hear the other mixes. We wanted to hear the Lee Scratch Perry mixes of Bob Marley and all of that. So I was already like a record collector and, 
you know, the, I want it to be fresh. You know, I wanted all the best moves and break dancing and different. So Brad was on that same page. So we sought after all of the stuff that wasn't normal. And um, a lot of those songs are what Brad covered. Either songs he liked, like What I Got, which is called Lovin' by Half Pint, or Caress Me Down. There would be songs that he liked. Or there would be, like, the computer dub CD by, I think it was Pritch Jamming, or Scientific Dub. And it was a whole dub record done on, you know, drum machines and keyboards, and it was just all dubbed out and weird, and we passed that tape around. I think I still have it in a box somewhere. Mm -hmm. It had candle wax on it, you know, and all this. It then passed around <laughs> so many different people. Yeah. So when these bands played, one of the things that we were interested in is this kind of question of venues and audiences. And there was a great paper this morning in the first session about all ages shows. I mean, so when you played, I mean, were these a, was a mix of house parties, mix of venues? Was there an all ages scene in Long Beach? Was there, I mean, you know, I wasn't there at the time to think about how it worked. What was the scene? What were the audiences like? Was there a sense that there was an audience into Long Beach bands that kind of supported each other in these large circles of friends? Well, the all ages scene were, was house parties. I mean, there was no <laughs> legitimate venue in Long Beach for, you know, at least when we started, and I know when Sublime started, there was no legitimate venues to play shows. I mean, you had your 21 and over places, but that wasn't as relevant to, to bands like us when we were getting started. So, the, you know, later on, the only place that would have us play that was kind of a venue was Toe Jam, well, originally Grand Central Station. But um, besides that, we were on our own. It was very do-it-yourself, um, it was a very do-it-yourself kind of scene, you know, very much influenced by the punk scene. And just you know, also influenced by sheer necessity, because you know you had to you had to make things happen on your own in Long Beach because definitely no one was going to do it for you, and you really had no other outlets but your own motivation. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we all made our own we made our own records, we made our own tapes, we made our own. I mean, there there wasn't even CDs at the time, so it was all it was all cassettes and records, mostly cassettes, really. You know, right. and you know you either record the demo at your house, maybe rent a little bit of studio time with money that you saved up from playing shows, and, um, you know, a lot of times dub off tapes, you know, on your dual cassette player and uh, make your own little photocopied covers, and then that's what you'd have for sale at these shows. So, I mean, it was very, you know, it was very, you know, it's pretty gritty and rough, but, you know, that's how you got things done. It's just how it was. We tried um, a couple of shows um, at the bigger venues, and most of them were pay to play. So you got a stack of tickets, you had to sell them. You were responsible for them, and um, we didn't like that too much. We got a chance to open up for HR from Bad Brains, and when he had his project Human Rights, came to Long Beach. And one of the national venues in Long Beach, which you didn't get a chance to play unless it was a situation like this, um, Bogarts. So we got an opportunity to open for HR, not only open for him, but we were his backing band. And that was one of the best experiences of my life, because HR, the singer of Bad Brains, is one of my you know, quintessential vocalists when I talk about vocalists. And that was a venue that people longed to play at. You know, I hope I get to play that venue. That was the, but Backyard Parties, just like Dennis said, was it. I mean, that's where we resided and made contact with our community of, of um, Fans and just everything was backyard parties. Yeah, well, we, you know, sometimes we, you know, at least in speaking for suburban rhythm, we would rent out, you know, Lions Club, Shriner Halls. Uh -huh. We even played show. We even set up shows at the Art Theater in Long Beach, which is an old movie <laughs> theater, and uh, quasi legal would be the best way to put it. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the final show of the art theater, basically, you know, we tried to make our most legitimate show, and of course, you know, eight cop cars show up and two police helicopters show up, and, you know, all these all these policemen and women come out with their batons and basically tell everybody to get the F out of here, and, you know. Uh, that's another thing I remember about putting on shows in Long Beach, a lot of, lot of, lot of attention from the police. Don't forget the warehouse parties. Oh, warehouse parties, too, of course, you know. These, these, yeah. um, Vacant warehouses in yeah. the industrial area of Long Beach, off of say Pacific and mm -hmm. Santa Fe. Yeah, Santa Fe. Uh -huh. And someone would break in and plug in. Oh, okay, they got electricity, or they'd run power from somewhere else, or bring generators. Yeah. And people would go in there with no lights, and the band would set up and play until the police came and broke it up. Yeah. We played a few of those as, when I was in Sublime warehouse parties. They are called. What kind of bands would you play with? I mean, one of the things, if there's all this, you know, kind of heterogeneous 
people mixing at various clubs and different sounds, and people coming together. I mean, I mean, did Sublime play with bands that in essence sounded like Sublime? Did you play with only other ska bands? Was there a diversity in, in the gigs, like the fact you'd be sitting next to your, your friend in the Iron Maiden t-shirt at Toe Jam, <laughs> you know, whatever. Or were, or were shows relatively homogenous in sound? Like there's a punk show, there's a hip-hop show, or was there a little more cross-pollinization? Well, I think due to the nature of both Sublime and Suburban Rhythms and Music, there was never a case where we would play with bands that sounded like us, you know, because each one of our bands um, incorporated a lot of different sounds. I mean, the one thing we, I think both of us shared with punk rock was kind of the do-it-yourself attitude. And, um, but, you know, speaking, you know, speaking for myself, you know, we would never play with bands that sounded like us. Just, it was, that's just not how Long Beach is. I mean, that's one thing I, I liked about Long, or I still like about Long Beach is bands tend not to sound like each other there. You know, you don't, you know, because, because, you know, because, you know, because of the relative proximity to every, you know, to everyone who's involved in the music, art scene, whatever, um, you know, everybody, everybody is so cooped up next to each other. I mean, it's reflect, it reflected in the shows that were played, you know, I mean, we would, you know, we might play with a punk band, but we also might play with a reggae band, or we might play with, you know, a metal band. Or you know a hip hop group or just something. I mean, it just it it, it varied. You know, it really varied because that's what was around. And uh, you know, since both of our bands kind of operated outside of any specific scene, you know, you always had mixed bills. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, Sublime, however, did play a lot of shows, and a lot of their following were punk rockers. And if you ask. Brad, Bud, and Eric, all three of them would say they're punkers playing this music. But if they could, they would play punk rock the whole time. So there are bands like Falling Idols, um, The Juice Bros was a side project that Eric had, and they were, just, they were just punk rock. And that was the main thing. That was their lifestyle. They were mm -hmm. punk rockers. And, you know, that's where I kind of played the role as the, the outcast guy. Because, <laughs> you know, that's where the discrepancy came from, in all honesty. Because I was a you know, raised in blues and jazz and just a break dancer and, and that type of thing. And a lot of the the fun stuff they called fun to me was just outrageous. <laughs> no, man, you guys, yeah. this is crazy, Take you know. <laughs> yes. Socks full of certain things, throwing them at people. I just, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> yeah. But I appreciated them as people, and that's why we continued and made the music we did, and I still have friends to this day that are considered, you know, punk rock. And yeah. that's, what Long Beach is about. So was there a sense then um, about that, I mean, that Long Beach was different? I mean, was there a self, I guess I'm trying to say, was there a self-consciousness in like the 80, late 80s, early 90s in this moment about Long Beach being different both from Orange County but also from L.A.? I mean, did the bands foray into these kind of other areas? I assume these boundaries are more permeable than we think in some ways. Um, was there a sense that Long Beach might have had like a chip on its shoulder? I mean, that kind of sense of like Long Beach is different in some ways? Because I think we think of it now, but I guess I'm trying to get a sense historically, was there a sense living through that moment? That, like, we're from Long Beach and we're different in some ways than other parts of the Southern California music community. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I thought felt we were different, but I didn't. We didn't dwell on it too much. Yeah. We were too busy just having fun and yeah. playing shows and making music. And you know, I mean, I don't know. At the time, I didn't really give it much thought. I mean, it's easier to see in retrospect, but mm -hmm. at the time, I, I, I can honestly say that we didn't didn't give it too much thought and seeing in retrospect yeah. I mean what do you see as the difference then I mean looking backwards at the you know at that moment I mean was it what were the advantage I guess and disadvantages of being Long Beach as opposed to other parts of the area um I didn't really I didn't really see Long Beach as being a disadvantage when I was in suburban rhythm I mean you know again it's all seen in retrospect but you know looking back obviously we weren't heavily involved in like a you know these cliques that were going on in LA proper or Orange County proper although you know with Suburban Rhythm we ended up getting a very large following in Orange County mm -hmm. um, and you know we brought a lot of, you know a lot of kids you know we play Orange County a lot, a lot of kids up from Orange County into Long Beach and um, yeah I mean it's it's you know we like I said when we were kids it's just you're just too busy having fun so you know we'd play you know we'd just play shows and you know it's like what Lemmy from Motorhead said you know raise your flag and see who salutes it <laughs> that's great um, again uh, Eric 
and Brad, when I was in the band, and their friends, uh, most of them anyway, because there were a lot of friends that were just surfers and studios and whatnot, they were punkers. So everybody was, you know, a hair band or, uh, you know. But the main thing with them and, and me too was just being original. So if you played and you were in a hair band, if you were original, it's beautiful. But when you were just trying to be like Rat or just trying to be like, you know, Snoop Dogg or just trying to be like, then you immediately would get called on that and that would be a point of contention. And not so much to just talk, but to go, give me that, let me show you how to play. You know, that was kind of the attitude of Sublime. So it wasn't necessarily a Long Beach chip on the shoulder, it was a, like personal, you know, attitude that these punk rockers and me as a competitive break dancer, I had it as well. I always wanted to play. Let my playing show you, you know. Mm -hmm. You guys can't play. Give me that. <laughs> you know, but um, beside that, I mean, we liked our scene. We didn't like to play in L.A. because the pay to play. That's what I remember. <laughs> so we, you know, ah, L.A., they don't know what they're doing. So let's just stay at home in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's interesting, yeah, because I, I get a sense sometimes from talking to current musicians in Long Beach, they still feel a little bit out, kind of like as outsiders. I mean, partly because of the lack of infrastructure in some cases in terms of venues and so forth. So, I mean, would you say that, you know, d d d it, both then and particularly now, so we can start opening it up to a larger discussion here, I mean, is Long Beach a supportive place then in that sense for, for, for music? I mean, I, I mean, it's hard to tell, I guess, unless you've played in many other different kinds of places. I mean, to give you an example, when I was in bands in the um, 1990s in Minneapolis, it was a great place to be in bands. I mean, there were lots of venues, lots of clubs. You could have regular gigs that allowed you to pay the insurance on your van, and you had a regular circuit. You could tour in the upper Midwest. I mean, it, was a, it was an awesome place in the 90s to kind of be in a band. And I get a sense from talking to my students and friends who are in bands in Long Beach today, they're like, oh, there's really not, like, there's not really a way to be kind of a musician and do that as the main thing you want to be trying to do in Long Beach uh, as opposed to um, maybe some other parts of the country. Does it seem like a good place? I mean, people, you guys still have Long Beach projects going on. I mean, mm -hmm. Would you even think of them as Long Beach projects anymore? Are they just they're just projects. They're not. Well, I mean, they're projects, but you know, I mean, they're Long Beach projects in so much as you know, a lot of the musicians we play with are local. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I always thought Long Beach is kind of a good petri dish to experiment. You know, I mean, because we have you know a diverse range of people you know you can you can kind of try out different things and you know and um, you seem to have a pretty receptive audience there um, but uh, I don't know I mean it's I, I don't think there's anything that's centralized in Long Beach as far as like any, anything that's uh, centralized in terms of being a place for musicians to meet or collaborate I mean it's just every, like you know again going back to what I said earlier it's just Long, Long Beach is just a group series of people who kind of have to make things happen for themselves. And, um, you know, because really it's only been recently that city officials, you know, have, have, I think, been a little more open to supporting the musicians in Long Beach. You know, you have things like the Summer Music Festival, you know, who are starting to put on, you know, you know, things like the Funk Fest, you know, they're starting to, you know, book local bands to play you know these these little you know these little outdoor events during the summer but you know during the 80s and the 90s it definitely was not like that i mean um you pretty much had you know you had you know the the authorities were not very friendly toward underground bands you know i mean they were you know i mean i i there's i'm sure marshall could tell a lot of stories too i mean um but yeah it, the so the idea that so, they block off, you've been in Long Beach in the summer, they block off a whole block of First Street and bring mm -hmm. a portable stage and they have all these bands playing outside. Completely unimaginable based on the 1980s and 1990s. Well, yeah, I mean, bands that have younger sponsoring people. Sponsoring bands playing outside. I would say younger bands time. that younger people care about. Right. Maybe if they were going to do something like back then, it would be more for, like, the Baby Boomers or, right. you know, they'd have some classic rock cover band yeah. or whatever. They have a busker but, fest for, the, for younger bands. Like, yeah. all the yeah. all the young mm -hmm. bands get to play it. Yeah. That's the only legitimized outlet <laughs> yeah. for that these days. But there's nothing centralized, though, yeah. no. It's just, yeah. you know. And I wouldn't come to Long Beach if you're seeking music. Of course you go to L.A. <laughs> there's just so much more there. There's rehearsal studios. There's just so much recording studios. I mean, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. You come to Long Beach to relax and, you know, um, experience the culture. And if you happen to be able to form a band and, you know, um, you want to pursue that, it would need to be your second you need to have a job or be students, you know, like Brad and I were or something else because you can't, there's nowhere you can go to get gigs every night. You know, maybe one group 
is enough for one group. But it's not a good competitive, there's not a competitive market here for musicians, not at all. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good way to end, I think, this kind of conversation. Suggestive, I hope, about some ideas about the past and present. And it gives us about 10, 15 minutes for some questions from the audience and other ideas people have about these scenes. But let's thank uh, Marshall and Dennis, though, first. And then we'll take some questions and see how, how we go about scenes, about local scenes, questions, comments, observations. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's, like, so many questions to ask. So, yeah, I mean, I, I started playing bands in the 90s. A lot of you guys did too, uh, or yeah, like some of you like 80s, but 90s, where yeah, you still had this like direct connection to I think that like I guess punk kind of thing that came out really in the 80s where you had zine culture, right? And record stores where people it was really kind of in a lot of ways like a geographic thing where you were bumping into people on the street and at clubs and at parties and having like conversations and then reading zines and then maybe your friend would give you a zine and take it home and you give it to somebody else. So like that was really real for those of us who have experienced that in the 90s or 80s. But uh, now to me what's so different, you know, not to sound stupid, but like the internet, it just really has like changed. And so I feel like less and less I look for evidence of like geographic importance, and I just don't, I don't really know that I see it so much. You, know, you have like these bands that are from places, but where they're from doesn't seem to be as relevant. So I guess I'm, I don't know if I'm asking a question, but I'm just yeah. curious like what you guys think, if any of you have kind of written about that or thought about it or how it's explained affecting your lives. Well, we talked about it quite a bit in our various meetings about yeah. this, and that, in fact, I think that that's what's different. And one of the questions that kind of emerged from thinking about the whole conference here about the idea of local zone is whether localism means anything anymore in the age of the Internet. I mean, that, you know, anything is accessible, YouTube clips of various bands, various styles. I mean, as a record collector, like, nothing's rare anymore. I mean, you can, even if it's rare, you can still find it and listen to it for the most part and get, get access to it. And, and I do wonder if it's kind of flattening out in some ways the sense of the importance of a local group of people that kind of generate a sound. And in some of it, maybe this era is one where it's kind of marking the beginning of transitioning out of that. I, I don't know, but I think there's something to that. And we want to, one of the things we wanted in some of our more notes about the conference, kind of, kind of deconstructing the entire idea that there is a local scene in that sense, because you know, things seem to be so fluid in this kind of moment. Influences can come from everywhere. No one seems to be from any kind of place. But, yeah. but maybe you guys have some ideas about I that, too. I think that's well. a great point. I think um, as big as the, the zines were, because I have a little exposure. I forgot to mention that I was in a band called Garble Crack. It was a punk oh, band. Garble Crack. <laughs> oh, my God. Taking it back. You're in, God, what band haven't you been in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the list is long. I'm only mentioning the highlights. <laughs> This band, we did two records, and the singer um, passed away. His name is Seth, and his father ran Arrow Bear Music Camp. Mm -hmm. And he was a 1,000% punker, um, anarchist, the full-on deal. And I got a chance to be exposed to the, the fanzines and all of those things. And it was very, like you're saying, it was a communal thing. You know, you kept in touch with people, and people wrote, and people were in it. You know, and it was a great source, much better as far as creating a community, um, a tangible community for things, you know, than the internet. The internet is the information, I mean, you can't get any more information anywhere else, but for that click, those that zine era was wonderful. And I think that's something actually that could be marketed right now in this day and age, to bring people out again and, and to bring in a nice community, you know, and start a fanzine right now, you know, Working or something. On it. Yeah, exactly. I think that that would be safe wonderful. from open matter. Right. We're well, gonna get some zine making together. <laughs> well, I think there's still. I mean, I still think there are local scenes. It's just um, how people find out about them has changed. But I mean, there's still a local scene. At least, I, at least in Long Beach. I mean, there's different cliques within the city, which that's all. That's always been the case, whether there's been zines or whether you find out on blogs. But you know, I think. You know, particularly because Long Beach is still, you know, even though it's kind of a small town vibe, it's still a large city, so there's still a lot of musicians who congregate there. There are scenes in the city, but, you know, again, how it's, it's how the information is disseminated that's changed. Um, but it just, you know, you know, with, with the zine culture, it's just, it was harder to get that, obviously harder to get that information out, you know. I mean, you really had to, 
you know, you know, pre-internet, you really had to work to find out, you know, where you, you, you know, how, what was going on in each of these given cities. You know, what I mean, you know, the punk scene was the perfect example. You know, you had all these, you know, all these very, very local scenes. You know, you that you really had to work for to find out. Like, you know, you had your very distinct scene in Washington D.C. with my, you know, with Discord Records. You had your very distinct scene in the South Bay with SST. You had your very distinct scene in the Pacific Northwest, you know, Poison Idea and all those bands from Oregon, Seattle, you know, Wipers, whatnot. But, um, you know, it's still the same. You know, as far as scenes go, there's still scenes, but it's just, you know, no more zines. Well, I think what's interesting in Long Beach especially is this interaction between the, the physical and how people are still interacting in person and how people are finding things out on the internet. And there is, and I think in Long Beach more than anywhere else, if there is some localism left in Long Beach, it is that combination like, uh, I mean, like Avi Buffalo, he has, he's a millennial, so he has access to all these things. He told me once he just hits album media fire and downloads things uh, instantly. But at the same time, he grew up playing uh, with some blues acts in Huntington Beach, you know. So he grew up physically playing with these blues people that were in, that were around. He plays with a, you know, in a, a gospel band at a Baptist church. That's a physical thing that would not be able to happen if he was living in the Midwest and maybe in, in a more segregated town and ha hacking things on the internet. Um, and I mean, Dengue Fever is another example of that—that that interaction between internet and in person. Because these guys discovered the psych rock and stuff through the internet. Someone up uploaded the Sin Sissimoth and stuff. All these. Uh, old Cambodian acts to the internet, they discover it, then they realize, oh, we got to go to Long Beach to find a, a singer. They come to Long Beach, they experience the, the Cambodian pop scene that's very alive in Long Beach, and they find a Long Beach singer. That's an interaction that wouldn't have been able to happen outside of Long Beach. So I, I think if there is some localism, it might be that interaction between the two, that people are finding things online and then putting them into use. Uh, Wild Packet Canaries is kind of that way. The singer is really into South American bands, which don't really have an importer, like Astro is this uh, Argentine band he's really into right now. And he tells me all the time that he's just Googling deeper and deeper into like uh, Brazilian MCs and, and Argentine psych rock groups and all these guys that are, that are unaccessible, inaccessible outside of the internet to him. But then he brings them to his bandmates in Long Beach who are bringing all these other influences together and then they can jam off of this stuff he found on the internet. So maybe somewhere in between. Yeah, that's right. Other thoughts? Yeah, Actually, Marshall has a fan now in Pennsylvania who wants to know, oh, number nice. one, um, When's your solo project going to come out? <laughs> <laughs> also wants to know, what impact does Sloppy Second have on Long Beach? And maybe you can talk about what Sloppy Second refers to. <laughs> well. Solo project, it's absolutely coming. Um, <laughs> I have new management. There hasn't really been much that I've done on my own. But uh, my management team and I are, we've been planning for the last year about, I'm just going to explode. I'm just going to do a lot of stuff. So. Upcoming, absolutely. MartialArtsMusic.com, man. <laughs> um, as far as Sloppy Seconds and the impact, I mean, that's essentially where Sloppy Seconds was. So let me start with this. Downtown Mission, um, kind of the jam rock, 70s rock, folk. That's a big scene in Long Beach when I was young. So there were lots of musicians playing that type of music. Downtown Mission was one of those bands. Sloppy Seconds was one of those bands, but ventured into the, started playing a little reggae. You know, and my sister, again, was a saxophonist for that band. Brad was the singer, Eric was the bassist. They had another drummer, and I believe they had a keyboardist. So that essentially was a place where Brad and Eric were honing a sound, you know, and then Sublime started, and that's where they kicked in to the I mean, it started with the roots of creation. There's a song called Romeo, and it was still kind of that, you know, uh, 70s rock vibe. You can hear it in the way he's singing. But then all of a sudden, it was just a transition with 40 Ounce of Freedom. That's when I joined the brand. I brought jazz fusion. I brought, you know, hip hop. I brought all this other stuff. Brad, you know, finally, okay, I'm going to DJ a little bit, which means, you know, rapping Jamaican style and all that. So I think Sloppy Seconds was, was integral in the whole. Um, progression of supply and the people involved. That's cool. We got a question from the internet. I know. That's kind of awesome. Other thoughts, seeing <laughs> locals <laughs> not, yeah. Um, uh, so I, I've been seeing the world through the prism of the runaways for the last three years. So <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah, um, she was from Long Beach, wasn't she? Yeah, Sandy West yeah, from Long Beach. Sandy West yeah. was born in Long Beach. Yeah. And Lita mm -hmm. uh, grew up there. She went to Poly uh, also. Nice. So mm -hmm. 
Um, Can we afford one to buy? understanding that was really <laughs> like a hotbed, a, a really a huge market for hard rock and heavy metal, and maybe not that many artists besides Captain Runaways would come there. But I, I guess I didn't pay much like that. I'm wondering how, how true is that but in that, especially in that era. I didn't really find any in my research, but you guys were there. I so mean, I think, I mean, you know, long, you know, that era, is, you know, Poly High School in particular, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how, how extensive the hard rock influence was. I mean, I think you pretty much uh, summed it up right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we did have, a, you know, we did have a number of famous, you know, musicians come out of, you know, come out of Poly. In fact, I have a yeah. list right here. Let me go <laughs> He's down. got a great list in his notebook. Of, uh, Let's okay. see. Uh, as far as rock goes, um, Julieta Venegas, oh, yeah, she you know, she was in a band called Tijuana No, and now she's a solo artist, you know, she, she went to, she's from Long Beach, um, let me find some, is there any other? Yeah, I've always thought in that context that the, uh, I mean, th there's a great, I think I said this before too, there's a great article to be written solely about Poly High School, yeah. in that the ways uh, in which certain high schools, music and arts programs created really interesting fusions of, of musicians, and the list of bands that come out of there, in particular, even going way early, so the, you know, the radio DJ Steve Probes did a, a gig, in fact, as a, for a war and dengue fever show on Martin Luther King Day a couple of years ago, he DJed doo-wop in between with long, long histories of all of these bands that came out of Long Beach High School schools and I keep thinking I keep wishing for the master student I could find who wants to do that project right who will who, who come in and let, let's go dig through the yearbooks and let's do some oral histories and look at the newspapers because I think that high school in particular would be a great case study of thinking about how the tradition within the high school of producing bands and having shows on campus produces even more kind of culture emerging there and then all the different sounds that come out of there so you have Jenny Rivera there at the same time as Snoop Dogg is there you have I mean it would just be kind of fascinating to kind of trace these threads and see how they work and I don't really know of any good studies of high school band scenes, really, and that would be kind of interesting to do if you picked that school in particular. I, I think they have a musical hall of fame at Poly. Right. There's like star, yeah, there, I don't know so where. Yeah. Spike, I've seen Spike Jones. Spike yeah. Jones, right? Yeah, maybe it's just mean, a celebrity like, hall of fame. Yeah. But I know yeah. I've seen the photos of Jenny, Jenny Rivera and yeah. Snoop Dogg's yeah. plaques, I guess they yeah. are. I guess sort of, you know, I was doing acid before we got to Poly High School, but. Um, you know, because I, I remember that first, my first association with Long Beach musically was when I was in high school choir, and my choir director went to Long Beach State, and he sang tenor with Karen Carpenter. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the choir. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, the, 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 a huge part of the Carpenter's story, the development of their sound, is about, like, you know, developing the spectrum of sound while they were music students at Long Beach mm -hmm. State. And so I was really kind of, you know, curious about the extent to which, I mean, I know that I did talk a little bit about the companies in that context, but, you know, the extent to which the college scene, like, you know, college music scenes tend to be something that, you know, are incredibly vibrant in any town of whatever size, how much that leads over into some of the scenes you're talking about. Yeah. No, I think it'd be a great uh, further project. I know we've talked before about that. That Long Beach, for a while, was very important. Long Beach State was very important as a place, as a venue where bands could play. Depending on which students were there booking certain venues, um, that would be an option for for, for bands to play there. Um, you know, so it would give you a gig, a paid gig, in essence, to play kind of through the concert. And uh, there's just been a really wild uh, DVD issue about a year and a half ago of a, a 40 year old live concert by a, basically a band that's a, a sounds like Iggy and the Stooges meets the MC5 playing in Long Beach. You know, at our University Student Union, and it's, it's, it's you know it's like the Imperial Dogs, I think they were yeah. called, right? And it was just one of those moments. And I saw this DVD, the Imperial Dogs live at Cal State Long Beach, and I'm like, what? You know, so it made me realize that the university scenes are really important, but they also come and go depending on uh, depending on who's involved. And the great example for that personally for me was through the history of like the radio station I worked with in D.C., which you know, went from being a you know over the air FM mega power important station to being little tiny carry current. Depends on who's running things, so these things really ebb and flow. But I think that the yeah the pull of the university scene, both for um, you know, musicians who play, but also for musicians who would have an opportunity to play there and make some money playing shows for students would be interesting. Did you guys ever play Long Beach, or the university, or the, or the city college? Or? Well, I was in Long Beach of All Stars, and that was essentially from 96 to about 2001, and one of our early shows was um, at Cal State Long Beach in, in one of the ballrooms, mm -hmm. and you know, um, the opening act was the Black Eyed Peas, actually. <laughs> and this was before yeah. Fergie I joined or show. they even got <laughs> it. Was Did Ozo Motley play that show too? I so. Yeah, that was it. Right. You remember that? Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, playing at the Nugget. We played the Nugget <laughs> often. Oh, yeah. I've been in numerous projects that would play noontime shows at Cal State Long Beach. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's it. 
I definitely remember playing the Nugget. In fact, um, <laughs> That's the my, yeah, my Van Suburban Rhythm played the Nugget a few times, and the last time we played there, um, so I, I don't know who was running things that night, but um, the the bar decided to serve beer to a bunch of underage kids, and by the end of the by the end of the evening, like several ceiling tiles had been kicked out, <laughs> a lot of the displays had been torn up, a lot of the uh, <laughs> Chairs have been broken, and they banned live shows there for six months after that. <laughs> so the ups and downs of college. The ups and downs of college. college. Yeah. I'm wondering about the the school. I don't know if this was. They don't do that now anymore. I know that. Uh, I, don't wanna... I, I don't know if this was your question, Karen, but now I'm wondering: is, is the music school, the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music, is that have people come out of there? I'm sure they have. And, yeah. I mean, I, definitely not as prolific as Polly, because Polly just kind of comes up on your radar when you Google Long Beach music, but. Um, I, I've always thought of the significance for the for culture anyway in Long Beach being the art school because it's such a great public art institution and you get all these artists in here, even performance artists and sound artists and stuff. And I don't, uh, I mean, I haven't heard of really any crossover with the art community from Cal State Long Beach into music at all. If you guys know about it, or if you knew anyone that went to Cal State for music ed well, education. I I went to Cal State Long Beach and I got accepted to Cal State Long Beach and UCSB. And the reason I chose Cal State Long Beach is because they had a great business department, which is what I wanted to do. UCSB had a great business department as well. But Long Beach had a great music department. So I stayed in Long Beach, went to Cal State Long Beach when I was 18. Business major, but I walked in and auditioned for the jazz band, the Steel Drum Orchestra. So when I was in there with a lot of those musicians, people came from all over the country to that program. And it was very particular. Here I go again with the hip hop thing. It's like, <laughs> why are you taking this so serious? You know, I I auditioned and got into these bands, and people actually were hard on me about that. They didn't. Oh, you didn't apply, and you didn't have to do a recital. No, I, I I play. I mean, what's wrong with that? You know, and and so it was always kind of tight. You know, a little too restrictive for me. I, I, I that really made me not want to even minor in music. But. Um, Again, that's because I came in a music scene that was so diverse and so relaxed and comfortable. Yeah. And, and but then that would, that would make sense if they were really strict in, in that sense and more classically trained. That would make sense why there wasn't a lot of crossover. Right. A lot of the, yeah, those people wouldn't get. Playing, right. Yeah, they wouldn't really get with the Long Beach scene. Yeah, exactly. Different style of music. Just exactly. a reminder, since it looks like we're out of time and going to end our session, but if the next one, if you're ever at the Cal State Long Beach campus, you must go to the Carpenter's Museum yeah. that's oh, in yeah. our uh, Carpenter Center, which is one of the great, interesting little yeah. secret music history <laughs> museums. <laughs> Uh, in the country. It's not open all the time, but usually you can ask someone at the box office to let you in to take a look at it. It's got Karen's drum kit and lead sister t-shirt and all that stuff all on display uh, <laughs> on the on the campus of Cal State Long Beach. Um, thanks for uh, coming and having great questions and ideas about this session. Um, hopefully it's helped us think a little more about the nature of local music and local scenes. And thanks to my co-panelists about all this. See a book in this, man. Come on, a whole big history of oh, life.